All my life I've enjoyed this mysterious, exciting experience. No other adventure of sleep is so disappointing to wake from. For while indulged in, it has a compelling reality like no other fantasy. In one of his most ambitious paintings of the Second World War, Battle of Britain, you can sense Nash's love of flight, tempered by abhorrence. He shows planes looping and circling as they engage in combat, the wildness of their movements preserved in the traces of their passage. Their trails are like man-made clouds, parodies of the emanations of nature which ominously interrupt the peace and tranquility of a bright blue sky. They've scarred the very air with their fumes and machine gun fire, just as the shells of the First World War had churned up the fields of Flanders. A single doomed plane is shown about to crash, falling from air to earth, its pilot about to meet a lonely Icarus death. Nash may have wanted to join battle with the Nazis himself, but he couldn't fly, not even an observation plane. Due to his respiratory problems, Nash never did make it up into the sky. Instead, he depicted crashed enemy bombers, decaying in the landscape, images of loss and failure. His asthma worsened, and Margaret became a full-time nurse to him. He still wrote to Agar, but their relationship was spiralling down. This letter, written on... I won't pick it up because it's very, very fragile. Uh, written on grey notepaper in red pencil that's so faint you can now barely read it. You can just make out the odd word. But luckily for us, when it was bequeathed to the Tate Archive, one of the archivists here transcribed what could be read at that point and typed it out. So we've got this. May I ask just what all this is about? It's an angry letter. Nash to Eileen. I find now that you are still in Earl's Court, where I presumed you might be when I wrote, and that you are not ill. She's been giving him the runaround. So why don't you behave? Don't tell me Joseph occupies the whole of your world, or is it contracting for other reasons? You are so lucky to be living in London, able to see so many people and share so many other lives. Remember, I live for weeks without meeting either friends or new faces. The few, the very few I love are infinitely precious. You have always been someone I can't lose. When Eileen received the letter, she tore it up. She later stuck it back together again. But this marks the end of the affair. Afterwards, Nash threw himself into his work. He repeatedly visited the aircraft dump of enemy planes in Cowley, Oxfordshire. Here, in the only existing footage of Paul Nash, you see him carrying out the preparatory sketches for one of his true masterpieces. A painting he gave the German title, Tortus Mare, Dead Sea. Nash hated Hitler, the failure artist, he called him. He detested Nazism. And I think by depicting this great sea of wrecked Luftwaffe, fuselage and aircraft. He is intending to suggest that the great tide of Nazi invasion that has laid waste to Europe is now finally at the ebb. It's on the way out. I think it's suffused with a kind of melancholy that's unavoidable. It's strange, it's weird, it is dreamlike. That landscape that lies beyond the wave of wrecked metal has an utterly haunting quality to it. 
it draws you into its vertiginous distance. The owl, symbol of Minerva, symbol of wisdom, hovering over the wrecked aircraft. And I wonder if there aren't elements of Nash's own melancholy embedded within it. It's about something that was flying that's fallen, that's been wrecked. Could it be also an allegory of his love for Eileen Agar, the great love of his life, which is now finally, utterly over? Could there be elements of reference perhaps to his own personal predicament? He is increasingly ill. His asthma is getting worse and worse. He can barely breathe. Does he sense that Paul Nash has identified himself so often with a bird in flight? Does he now feel that his own path is downward towards something like this cemetery formed from tangled, broken wings? It's a beautiful picture, and I suspect a very personal one. In 1942, with the war still raging, Nash escaped once more to nature. With aggressive asthma, he began a series of paintings of the place where his adventure had started, the Whittenham Clumps. So tell me about Nash's approach to the Clumps late in life. He went to visit the house of a friend in Boar's Hill, which is just about eight miles over there in the distance. And he found there was a good view of the clumps from inside the house. He was suffering with asthma, so he wasn't a well man. He wasn't able to get out and about as much as he would have liked. But he was able to view the clumps through binoculars. And he used them to create a whole new series of paintings of the Whittenham clumps. His early representations of the clumps are very neat and precise. Um, every last detail is recorded, but when he gets to Boar's Hill, suddenly his imagination soars and he paints these wonderful oils full of mystery and atmosphere. And he described the clumps as having a compelling magic for him. And he used to add what he felt was right in the foreground. He once said, I don't bother what grows where very much. I find things grow where, the, where I paint them. And I think that's a lovely way of describing how he set about just making these, these scenes for himself. So one thing that you really feel when you're up here is you, you just feel how much air there is, how much wind, how much breeze, how much sky. And I can't help wondering if Nash, poor old Nash, down there with his binoculars, wasn't looking up to the clumps almost tried to, to draw that air into his lungs by painting. He wrote that he could feel himself making his first drawings again. He thought that they were some of the best drawings he ever made, and that excitement came back to him as he, as he recalled the first time he, he came here. Hmm. So it's almost a form of rejuvenation to return. Very definitely. At the end, to become young again. Yeah. Whitnam had given Nash so much as a young man, and now it gave him space for his imagination as his frail body, racked by asthma, declined. I think there's something very moving about Paul Nash's last years here, close to the Whitnam clumps. He knows his body's giving out on him. He's like one of those aeroplanes, grounded aeroplanes that he'd painted in Totus Mir. His time is nearly up, and yet he responds with this tremendous surge of energy, painting this landscape, which meant so much to him, again and again. Of course, the scene itself in 1943 and 1944 was nothing like it is now. This was, in effect, part of the theater of war. The whole area was fenced off like a military installation. And on the nights of the great bombing raids 
Up to 800 planes would gather in formation in the skies directly above the clumps from the American Air Base over there and the RAF base over there before flying off to wreak havoc. Yet in Paul Nash's paintings, there is no trace of that. Yes, there's unease, there's turbulence, shafts of light that seem almost like search beams. But in other pictures, there's a tremendous sense of tranquility and hope. Religious symbols appear for the first time in his work. The lily symbol of the Virgin Mary, the sunflower, emblem of the soul that turns always to face God. There's a softness and a lightness in the palette. It's as if he's painting an Eden of the imagination, some kind of paradise to which he hopes he will return to which he hopes he will be transported by the inevitable fact of his own death. There's a sense that he's getting ready to meet his maker. They're among the last paintings he ever created. Solstice of the Sunflower, 1945, is one of Nash's final paintings. In the background are his Whittenham clumps, bathed in the solstice sun. Centre stage, a sunflower, almost floating. Nash said he saw the sunflower like a wheel of fire, but with its open form and trail of cords tying it to the sun, it also resembles a parachute. Nash had been haunted by fears of a parachute invasion of Britain during the Second World War but was also fascinated by their movements. He called them aerial flowers. Nash was very frightened of death, but told a friend he was able to face the end of his life by persuading himself that it was akin to flowers aerially born, a kind of eternity of fragrant and gentle drifting. So is the sunflower parachute, perhaps, Nash's vision of himself, gently drifting, into the hereafter. On the 11th of July, 1946, Paul Nash died in his sleep in Boscombe, a seaside resort, on a trip back to his beloved Dorset. Margaret followed his final wishes, and Nash is buried near the family home in Ivor Heath. Back close to the bird garden and trees that began his life and work, close to the landscapes that inspired Nash to become one of Britain's great landscape painters. Nash remained enigmatic to the end. A strange bird-like creature, perhaps from one of his paintings, perches on his grave. Is it guarding him? Is it haunting him? Nash had worked magic with the materials given to him harsh experience, an uneasy mind, and a frail body. And he had always been haunted, haunted by life, by death, and by the ghosts of war. Renowned poet Benjamin Zephaniah takes us on a personal tour of the new Turner exhibition at Tate Britain. Benjamin Zephaniah's Private View, available exclusively now on BBC iPlayer. Next tonight, though, time for our regular visit to the team at the Sky at Night. On the lookout for alien life, next.